Hello, and welcome to episode 24 of the Horn Notes podcast. I'm John Erickson. I teach horn at Arizona State University, and one of my interests the last couple of years has become very interested in, in the MRI horn studies that have been going on. And this episode, we're going to kind of look at those, uh, at least talk through some things about those um, here in this podcast. Uh, now, past, this past January, I gave a presentation at the Southwest Horn Workshop on this topic. Now, the presentation there was titled 10 Insights You Can Apply to Your Plane from the MRI Horn Studies. And it was driven partially by, I think, a lot of people. Number one, they don't really see the value of what's in this for me. You know, I mean, there's these interesting studies. Sure, they can see some stuff about tonguing or whatever. What's in it for me? And uh, it's been, I just wanted to present it in a way that people could apply some of those things to their their own actual plane. Um, since I had an hour as well, I was able to get into some background, um, some of the prior studies and things like that. So first I'd just like to talk about those a little bit. So to begin, the there's a problem, you know, just to begin with, which is the problem that, you know, all authors of books basically to this point have had to deal with, and the problem is speculating about brass plane mechanics. Um, traditional de descriptions of brass plane mechanics are often actually flawed, um, as as the studies will show. Um, you know, we're fooled by our senses and the power of suggestion, teachers speaking in visualizations, etc. And also, problems are caused, you know, from our perspective as students of the horn by following too closely flawed words in books. Um, now, it would help to have x-ray vision, and that actually led to an interesting earlier study that you can actually look at um, online uh, at this time pretty easily if you'd like a little extra background. So where you would go to find those is if you go online at YouTube and you look, search for something called the Joseph Mites x-ray movies of trumpet and horn player you can see some of these these videos what they did was these are um, just sort of uh, basically movie film videos done in x-ray um, the this, this study itself was published in the journal of music research and music education volume 16 number one spring 1968 um, and the title of it is a cinefluorographic investigation of brass instrument performance. And it, it's a pretty interesting study. It couldn't be done ethically today. Um, and the, the flaw of x-ray is that it only shows clearly hard tissues uh, like the teeth and the bones. Um, the um, tongue, the lips, things like that don't show up very clearly. Um, but still, there it it, it was interesting. Uh, you can see those. You can see a few things. And I'll come back to those here in, in a minute. Um, another one that's a super interesting um, earlier study is the high-speed videos that were done of trombone embouchures by Dr. H. Lloyd Leno. And uh, if you look up on YouTube, Lip Vibration of Trombone Embouchures, um, you will find a three-part video there. And he, he videotaped some big-name players. Um, and it's pretty interesting to see how the lip actually moves, although you're only seeing sort of externally how the lip moves as it goes through ranges. But nevertheless, the actual motion of the lips is pretty interesting to see. And there are others to mention briefly, uh, particularly related to the trumpet. Um, there are some older studies by Faye Hansen, who did some uh, very interesting work on x-ray, but dangerous, definitely. And then there's another uh, notable study that was documented in a book that was published in 2005, but it was done somewhat earlier than that, I mean, a number of years before that. Uh, it's documented in the book Trumpet Technique by Frank Gabriel Campos. It's published by Oxford University Press. That has some very interesting um, quotations about the about telling but the background of the ones we just talked about. Uh, but also this thing. So over a five-year period, though, they did these these studies, and there's some, um, basically, uh, among others, like Maurice Andre uh, was one of the, the trumpet players done, and there's a quote in the book reads uh, that he was astounded, that he was completely unaware that the tongue arched to produce changes in register. 
Um, like many of the world's finest players, he just did it without thinking. And that, that kind of gets at kind of the heart of what the MRI studies can show us, is, is there's a lot of stuff we just can't feel or perceive uh, with these motions inside our mouth, but actually they're very significant. And if you're not doing them correctly, or in some sort of flawed manner, things are going to break down. Things won't work right, things are going to break down. So all this leads us to this more recent work that's being done using the MRI studies at the Max Planck Institute in Göttingen, Germany. Um, with these, um, basically, as, it, as I was saying, uh, the MRI allows a clear and safe look at a slice of soft tissue motion inside the mouth and head. And they're filming it at a high speed. Um, the original inquiry goals of the lead investigator, who is Dr. Peter Iltis, were focused on embouchure dystonia. And it's still actually one of their focuses. Um, and, and part of understanding dystonia is, is, is you have to have a baseline to compare it against. So they've, they can look at dystonic players, but you wouldn't know what they're doing wrong unless you have a baseline comparing them to elite horn players who, who play very, very well. So there's like three articles have been published related to this, which can be seen on the, the screen right now. Um, very medical in nature, basically scientific, but super interesting nonetheless. Um, there's also two official videos that Dr. Iltis has done in, in association with uh, Eli Epstein. And there's also two videos in a German TV show that were done by Sarah's Willis, which you can find online. Um, a number of shorter clips, um, but also I did a three-part podcast a year ago with Dr. Iltis, which I'll reference here a little bit later, and also a book influenced by the studies as well, which is um, the Eli Epstein third edition of Horn Playing from the Inside Out. And he went back and he really reworked his earlier book to more, to, to closely match physiological reality rather than just being sort of visualizations and, and such, which is typical of, of books. So just as a little additional background on the MRI studies, so the instrument used has to be non-ferrous um, because it's based on you know, magnets. Um, so that's one element. Um, for these studies, they used an all-brass natural horn body that was built by Richard Serafinoff, um, which, which was connected to a plastic crook, effectively, um, and a plastic mouthpiece, which is what they were blowing on inside the MRI chainer, chamber. Um, and, the, and this is important to use the whole instrument actually because the, the preliminary study, one of those articles you could see, um, they did using a burp and the results are not actually the same as actual horn playing. Uh, something about the resistance of it, something about the way it blows. So it's important that it's using an actual horn. Um, now one concern you could have too, if you're like getting this far into this thing, is, is are you going to get paralyzed by analyzing yourself so much? And And this is a valid concern, um, but I think an advanced teacher certainly can make and apply a principles from these studies to specific situations. You know, it's a, it's a tool in your toolbox, and you do want to know what's really going on. Um, if it's more information than should be applied to a situation, I mean, you can decide that, you know, um, but you really can't ignore these, cause these studies because they do reflect physiological reality. So before getting to my 10 points that I, I want to talk through a little bit from the studies, I will mention one other kind of spoiler alert, I guess, in that I'm not going to have any videos embedded within this podcast or uh, still images because I don't necessarily have, I don't have permission to put them on, number one. But number two, I think after listening to what I'm talking about, you can easily go to something like the Sarah Willis uh, full run of the videos and you can see a lot of stuff in there once you're kind of aware of what you're looking for and what it is. So kind of stick with me here as there's some very good points that you can apply to your playing here. Okay, so on to our point. So the first point is kind of a big point. It's like a pretty important point. Um, it has to do with intonation, range, and accuracy, which is like everything pretty much, right? Um, so the big thing is you'll see right away on the videos that tongue position changes markedly by range. Um, among elite players, the generalization would be high is like he, 
and low is like haw, just like the old uh, sort of 70s uh, TV show, Hee Haw. Uh, but no, it's not exactly like that. But if your vowel is off, though, you will have issues probably sooner or later. Um, intonation could be one of them just to begin with, um, but certainly it helps range production on the horn to use this principle. Also, certainly it helps accuracy to be consistent with this, too, to be thinking positioning. Um, also, your articulation point is impacted by this arch as well. Uh, if you're more of a he or more of a ha lower position, your tongue is going to hit a little different place. So, so this gets back to like I was saying, talking about how these were related to dystonia, and one of the the general things that they've figured out is people who develop dystonia tend to not be using optimal mechanics, especially in relation to tongue position. Um, so the high range, for example, you can kind of muscle them out with your lips, but you need to have the correct tongue arc behind it to aid with tone production. Um, so this is just like a, a, a side point, but it's actually kind of important in relation to the studies. So if you want to see the register thing, there's two different sources I would say to look at. One would be to go get the Eli Epstein book, the third edition. He's got some very good um, illustrations that are like his MRIs plus illustrations that go with them that you can see how the tongue shape looks. And he's being very conscious to be accurate to how it is. Then you can go watch the run of the Sarah Willis ones online. You can see the same things there. Um, it's a different person, but they're doing things essentially the same way. And it's, it's very easy to see the common elements. Um, even though right now you can do get kind of an impression of a similar motion if you just whistle. Now, not everybody can whistle, but if, with high, the he, the tongue moves in a very similar way to uh, what we're talking about with the MRIs in the different ranges. On to point two. So point two has to do with the jaw position and the low range. Now everybody talks about dropping your jaw and stuff like this and you can talk about it all day but people don't necessarily see it or feel it. Um, you know I always have students uh, something I picked up from Mike Hatfield when I was studying with him was to put your thumb on your chin and you can just feel where your jaw is um, much more clearly that is it moving you know a lot of people think they're dropping their jaw but they're not um, but you watch these videos you can see the jaw motion pretty easily um, now I will say it's actually easier to see in the old x-ray videos um, because they show hard tissues so much better uh, but nevertheless you can still see it in the um, MRIs as well. Um, if you just compare like a low note to a high note, especially down to low B flat, you can see how the jaw moves down and forward for basically everyone. And that if you're not doing that, you should be. A third thing you can see very easily in these videos, at least in, in the various versions of the runs, is you can see breathing. Um, and breathing is like, can really be an issue for some people. Um, breathing, the, the video, so the Sarah Willis one, for example, shows breathing from several different angles, also in the official MRI uh, video as well. Um, basically, things expand in literally every direction, including the sole, shoulders rising, uh, which was, a lot of people say is a no-no. Uh, the main thing is, I think a visual image of what a large breath looks like can be helpful for some people. And also, you can see really where the lungs are. Um, people often have sort of odd ideas where they are, especially, I mean, the, a lot of people kind of think they're down lower than they are. You know, your lungs extend up into your, in your shoulder blades, basically. So again, it's something you can see in the videos, and it's something I think can help you uh, kind of get over a hump with some people. So now point four is another one that's kind of a big point. Um, and it has to do with, I titled it, The Points of Resistance. Um, the reason I titled it that was because there's a chapter, or there's a discussion about that in the Farkas book, which is sort of overly detailed, and it's kind of a source of confusion for students. Um, my takeaways from seeing the, the MRI studies compared to um, the discussion in the Farkas book without knocking the Farkas book is that, I mean, he's trying very hard to, to describe things that you, he couldn't see. Um, the only 
significant point of resistance that you can adjust is the tongue. Um, the glottis is either open or it's closed, and, and it opens and closes in relation to tonguing. Um, your primary perception toward the, the adjustment of resistance is the tongue arch, which goes from like E to aw. So again, we're back to that hee-haw um, kind of a theory. Now, this also relates to the dreaded twa-twa in brass planes. And there's a type of tongue motion that you can see. Now, I asked uh, Peter Iltis about this when I was doing the podcast last summer, and he referred to these as pulsations of the tongue. Um, you can actually see them pretty easily in, in the players. So, like, they're going from note to note. You can see the tongue, it sort of closes but it doesn't close all the way to be an articulation. Now, this is something that's natural. And it's not to be suppressed. Um, but if you're hearing a twa twa, the actual source of it is this these tongue pulsations um, that the, the tongue does. Um, it's just again, it's it's a natural thing. It, you would need to you would want to minimize it somewhat so that you don't hear the twa twa. But it's actually something that's there, and it's it's just a natural thing. Um, again, if you don't believe this, you go look at the videos. They're they're actually plain as day to see. And I've never seen, heard this described in any print publication, actually. So this is actually just like a total new thing uh, for horn teachers and players to be aware of. For topic number five, uh, we just talked about the motion of the tongue. And again, it's a, he does, this is from the interview with, um, with Iltis last year. Um, basically, there's some horn methods state that the motion of the tongue is up and down, especially Farkas does. Um, and then other teachers think of it as being more forward and backwards. But actually, reality is the motion is um, what Iltis described as oblique. It's neither up or down or forwards or backwards. It's, it's kind of a 45 degree angly kind of a motion that you can see easily in the videos. And again, I, I think there's people out there who have a lot of tonguing problems and they're trying to do things that are impossible. Um, so it's good to see the actual motion and that can be helpful to people. Moving on to point six, it was kind of a brief one, it's about breath attacks. And it's not a, one of the protocols in any of the in the videos, but you can see, actually, or it's it's clear actually that what's causing a breath attack to happen is your glottis is opening. Um, it's not like you're shoving air from your lungs all the way from there, and you're not tonguing it. Um, the glottis also opens with every articulation until you get to a speed that's so fast that the articulation is solely controlled by the tongue. Um, but that's like a side point. The main thing is the breath attack is not a started way down in your lungs. It's actually your glottis is taking care of it. Okay, but then you're thinking to yourself, wait a minute, I don't want to think about my glottis. And it's actually probably a good idea not to think about it too much. Um, you, that's where you can sort of tie yourself up in knots. I, I'm always hesitant to mention it to students much because I think they're going to be like, ah, you know, just like really um, thinking about it way too much. Uh, just sort of a natural thing happens, so and it, that's how it happens. Some people have problems, though, so it's good to know what's really going on. So you can it's a tool in your toolbox to to try to help people play better. Okay, for point number seven, we have a pretty big topic. Number seven is about staccato and legato. So. The, the main issue is that, imp I'll, I'll say in quotation marks, air quotes, so to speak, important horn methods state to never cut off notes with the tongue. But actually, as many teachers know, the tongue does cut off notes in staccatos. Um, but the tongue doesn't cut off notes in legatos. So essentially, what you can see in the videos is the glottis resets either slightly before or slightly after the tongue resets. And this achieves a different note ending. Uh, the glottis provides the more legato end of a note, and the tongue su supplies the staccato ending. So with that stated, um, the next topic I had was multiple tonguing. And basically, multiple tonguing is mostly, it looks cool. 
on the video. So just like look at them on the thing. I don't know that you have anything you can really pull out of them that will change how you multiple tongue, but they do look cool. Point nine has to do with um, playing dynamics and finding the best sound. And this relates back to the first topic, this E and the AW position. You'll have the best tone when you have the best tongue position for that register and dynamic. But the key thing is it won't actually be the same for soft and loud. You can, you can hear it when you, you find that best position, but, but look at the videos. You can see like a, there's a crescendo, decrescendo within the Sarah Willis run, for example, and you can see how the tongue opens up considerably on the loud dynamic compared to the soft one. And it makes sense. I mean, the air's got to get through, right? If you're blocking it with your tongue, it's not going to get through. So in my presentation, I had 10 points, and we're to the final point, which is has to do with lip trills. And I will say that I was basically a believer in that the tongue didn't move in a lip trill. And, and it's not actually one of the protocols you can see online easily either. Um, but it has been looked at. Um, basically, uh, what Dr. Iltis told me in the podcast was that, that basically the, the MRIs do reveal that the tongue does move slightly, aiding troll production. So the people who talk about moving the... Tr I, I still am not convinced you want to like overly think about moving the tongue, but the tongue does move when you do your lip trolls. So I'm going to have one bonus point here for the uh, online version here, but it was in the real presentation too. And it's talking about location of the articulation point. And I would suggest, you know, looking at um, the Eli book kind of closely. He talks about this a lot, but I, I'm, I'm basically kind of on the fence. And, and unfortunately, the videos don't show this very clearly. Um, I think generally there is a sweet spot that's going to be the best place to articulate a note. Uh, but it's going to depend a little bit on the type of articulation and the speed of the articulation. So I'll just say in terms of my own playing and teaching, what I'm finding is that it looks, a legato note requires a slightly different contact point than a staccato note does. The legato is going to be slightly higher and more gentle. Um, you don't want it to interfere with the lip at all, whereas the staccato is going to tend to be a little more towards the lip opening. Um, so, but that's just, you kind of give that some thought when you're playing. Basically, it's not all the same. And you'll see that in the in the videos, for sure. It, not, not, nothing is the same. Things move around a lot. There's going to be unique location that every note will be its best. And that's how um, you achieve, you know, accuracy too, is, is just kind of getting that all sorted out even more in your plane. Now, just to like conclude, these studies, they're continuing, and uh, the window to do them will probably actually close in the next few years due to retirements at the Max Planck Institute. So this is an excellent time. You know, you can find online where uh, the official page is for this, and it's possible to donate. It's possible to help with these studies. Um, again, also, uh, my understanding is the Dystonia Foundation has been one of their, their big funders as well, so that's certainly another avenue you could consider donating to if you wished. But for more information, definitely search online MRI horn videos. You can find more information. And just thank you again for checking out this on the this epic 24-minute-long uh, episode of the uh, Horn Notes video podcast. And be tuning in again for more on a variety of horn-related topics.